Paul's first, Tim, Paul's first letter to young Timothy. And I'm going to begin reading tonight in uh, verse number 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would Bless the reading of your word tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless it to our hearing and to our understanding. Lord, that we may walk closer to you and be more like you, more pleasing to you. Our Heavenly Father, tonight as we have gathered together, we do ask once more, Lord, that you'd bless and meet the needs of all of these special requests to prayer that were called out and Lord, the unspoken on each one's heart. Lord, we, we have no hope but you. As they were singing, our hope is in the blood. And our Heavenly Father, tonight we ask that your Holy Spirit will arrange the atmosphere of this service. Pray that you would empower me to preach your precious word. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd cause each one to hear what thus saith the Word of God. You know, Father, it's up to the individual to not only hear, but to act upon what they hear. And that's up to them. Lord, it's my responsibility to give them the truth. I pray that you'll help me to do that tonight in a clear and understandable way. That you'll be magnified and honored. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake. Amen and amen. I read these three verses, but I really want to bring the message tonight out of verse number 15. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation. This is the truth. It's worthy of our hearing. It's, the worthy, it's worthy of our accepting. It's worthy of our being faithful to it. And here's the great truth. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now in that little phrase there in the, uh, in the second clause of the, sin of the Scripture, stretch your mind and make you think. Well, I'm not too interested in tanning your hide tonight, but I would like to try to stretch our mind and make us think a little bit tonight about our walk with God. Keep in mind, we're going to preach on the subject, what's the goal of your life? What's the goal of of your life. The text tells us, of course, why Jesus came. We already said that. But you know, there's a lot of Christians today uh, that they, they may very well be born again. They may be very well be faithful to coming to church. But uh, they seem to be discouraged all the time. They seem to be down and out all the time. They can't seem to, can't seem to get victory over things. You know, I got to thinking about that and, and discouragement, I think, comes many times because a person doesn't have any direction. They don't know what they're doing. They, they, they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And if, if you don't aim for something, 
why then you'll hit nothing every time. You know, if the Lord wanted you to go on to heaven, he would have come got you as soon as he saved you. He'd have took your life right there on the altar. <clears throat> but he lets you stay here. He let me stay here. There must be something that he wants us to do. Now, uh, the Bible tells us that, uh, that there's plenty of people in the Word of God who had goals for their life and uh, they lived their life trying to fulfill that goal. Moses, for example. Moses had a goal for his life. That was to lead God's people out of the bondage of Egypt. And he did it, did he not? He did it till the Lord come and got him and took him home. He did his job. He did what he was supposed to do. Was he perfect? No. Did he make mistakes? He sure did. Made one so severe it kept him out of the promised land. But we thank God that the promised land is not a type of heaven because if it is, then Moses would have gone to hell, wouldn't he? <coughs> no, no. Well, Joshua took over. Well, Joshua had a goal. Joshua's goal was different than Moses. Joshua's goal was to lead the people into the promised land. That's what his goal was. Moses got them out. Joshua let them in. Solomon had a goal. And that was to build the temple that God would not let his father David build. Nehemiah had a goal. His, his goal was to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. <coughs> the Bible tells us John the Baptist had a goal. He was to be the four, the apostle to the Gentiles. All these people had goals and they spent their life fulfilling the goal that God had for them. Now, I can't preach to you tonight, and no, neither would I be that arrogant to stand up here and preach on goals that you should have in your life. That's between you and God. I can't tell you what the goal of your life is. You'll have to ask the Lord about that. But I want to guide you into, into the Word of God, and I want to try to stretch your mind a little bit and make you think for the next few minutes. Not so much what the goals of your life should be, but some things you could, should consider when choosing a goal for your life. And let me say, goals are not just for the young people. Let me, let me re-emphasize that. Goals are not just for the young people. They're for those of us that have come on down the road a piece too. God always has something for us to do. But before we get into the message, I... I'd like you, where you're sitting, just to take a, a little quick inventory of your life. That's the one you crucified. He's the one doing all of this. And, and so he was very careful to not only to seek and to save that which was lost, that's scriptural, uh, but he also did not have a selfish bone in his body. He wasn't in the ministry. He wasn't trying to fulfill the goal of his life uh, for any selfish reason, he was doing it to glorify God. And then he was true to the Great Commission. Now when you consider uh, what you want to do for the Lord, uh, balance your desired goal for your life up against the Great Commission. There's your scriptural, there's your scriptural balance. I want to go do this. I want to do that with my life, okay? Well, the Bible says to go ye into all nations, teaching them uh, whatsoever commands you, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, there in Matthew chapter 28. So we're to go out and evangelize the lost. We're to lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We bring them into the house of God. We baptize them, and then we begin to disciple them. So, is the goal of your life, is it scripture oriented? Uh, do any of that, uh, any of the part of the Great Commission line up with what you want to do with your life? So we'll just suffice to say that your goal should be scriptural. You say, well, how in the world am I supposed to find a scriptural goal? I'm glad you asked. Read the book. Read the Bible, study the Bible, meditate on the Bible, uh, uh, take it in like you do food. I mean, it's sweet unto our taste and, and it'll do us some good. So spend time in the Word of God and you'll say, oh, there it is. 
Goals should not only be scriptural, but goals should challenge us. If, if we want to do something for the Lord, not only should they be scriptural, but they should challenge us. If the goal that you're choosing for your life and for what you want to do for the Lord is going to take little to no effort, and you already know everything to do, and, and you, you, that's really not a goal. A goal, needs to, a goal needs to challenge you, you know. I remember in cardiac rehab, they, they said if you get on that treadmill and you just walk along and enjoy the walk and you don't have to exert yourself, you're not doing any good. It's, it's, there's got to be a challenge there. There's, it's got to be, it's got to be an uphill climb. It's got to be something uh, that's going to cause you some sacrifice because there is no victories without sacrifice. Amen? A goal that challenges us should be something that makes us give 100% effort to it. It should be something that's going to force us to get out of our comfort zones and make us lean and depend upon God. And the goal should be of such a challenge that we can see the big picture. We know what we want to do, but at the same time, we have to focus on the details. What are you talking about? Well, let's say you're a Sunday school teacher. and We have several of those here tonight. Let's say that, uh, that you, 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 want, you want to have a goal to increase your attendance in your class. Now I'm not talking about having a big day. I'm talking about you want to really challenge yourself for the glory of God and you want to increase your regular attendance. Set it in anyhow you want to set it, you know. But let's just use that as an example. I want to increase my regular attendance. Well, that's a good goal. It's certainly scriptural, is it not? You know, to bring them into the house of God, to hear the Word of God, to possibly bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. Why, that's a very scriptural goal, but is it a challenging goal? Yeah, it is. Preacher, that'd be awful hard to, to uh, raise up our regular attendance. That's going to take some work. That's going to take some effort. I can see the big picture, but how do I do that? All right, you might want to write this down if this is something you want to do. I'm going to give you five things right quick, and they all start with the letter E, okay? First thing you need to do is you need to envision that larger class. Now the scripture for that, I told you that you you can use for that, is John 4.35. When the Lord told us to look unto the fields, they are white unto harvest. We see them, they're out there. I mean, there, there's enough unsaved, unchurched people within a five mile radius of this building. Without even leaving this county without even leaving this zip code to fill up every one of our Sunday school classes. So, so we, we, we need to catch the vision. We need to see that where are they going to come from? They're going to come from out here. Now, secondly, once you catch that vision, then you need to plan to enlarge. You need, you need to plan for God to answer that. And you need to plan on God's going to honor that labor that you're going to put forth to increase your regular, uh, your regular attendance. I mean, if you're going to pray for rain, carry an umbrella with you. Is that right? If you're going to pray for rain, carry an umbrella with you. If you're going to plan on increasing your attendance, then set your room up to be able to accommodate them when they come in. And then, and then when they come, then you're ready. The prayer of Jabez over in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 and in verse 10 in his prayer, he said, Lord, enlarge my coast. 
Make that part of your prayer. So envision the fields white unto harvest. Enlarge, prepare to, for the greater numbers. Enlarge my coast. Then get to work. The third word is energize. Put your plan into action. My friend, uh, the Bible does not teach us to run around out here and, and act like Jesus and then they'll just all come fall in our lap here at church. Bible doesn't teach that. Bible tells us to go out into the highways and into the hedges. Luke's Gospel chapter 14 verse 23 is your scripture for that point right there. Go out into the highways and hedges and do what? Compel them to come in that my house may be full. Now you can be creative and figure out how to compel them. Amen. The Bible says to compel them to come in. So, third thing is to energize. Put your plan into action. Start going out and, and uh, trying to invite people to come. Uh, go, go to contacts that you know. People that you know. Ask them to come to church. Ask them who they know that's not in church. Reach out and put your plan into action. But let me tell you the fourth is the word enlist. You can't do it alone. You're going to have to have some help. So en enlist others to get interested in your goal. Hey, I could use some help here. I, I want to, I've got a goal that I've set, and I believe that this would honor the Lord. It certainly is scriptural. I believe God will get credit for it, and God will get glory out of it. I'm wanting to build up my, my Sunday school attendance so we can get the Word of God to more people. Hey, would you help me? Uh, say this coming Saturday or, 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 or this uh, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, I've got a place I'd like to go knock on a few doors. And uh, I've seen some, uh, I've seen, say, if, you, if you're a young person, Sunday school teacher, I, I've seen some uh, swing sets out in the back and some, dry, and some uh, bicycles laying in the driveway. I bet there's young ones that live there that, and I might want to see if they'd like to come to church. Would you help me go out and knock on a few doors? Enlist people to help you. That's scriptural. The Bible tells us over in Matthew chapter 9, verse number 37 and verse 38, Jesus said uh, that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And he says, so, so therefore pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers into the harvest. So we go to pray and Lord, send me some help to help me to go out to fulfill this goal uh, that I believe will uh, glorify and honor you and I believe it's scriptural and I believe, the God, I believe God will honor that prayer and send you some help. And then the last ease, the hardest. Endure. Be persistent. Don't quit. Because it ain't going to happen first time out. It's going to take a little effort. I think I told you this one time before. I don't remember if I did or not. If I did, just entertain me again. But years ago at Box Mountain in the youth church, I had a young man down there. Sweet little fella. His daddy worked second shift and never got to see him in the evenings and, and uh, you know, missed his dad a lot. And one night during the teen service, we was having prayer time, and he raised his hand. He said, I want you to pray that my daddy will get off of that night shift and get on daytime so he can spend more time with us at home. And I said, all right, let's pray about it. And so when we took our break, me and him knelt down together. And we, had, we prayed specifically, me and him together, that his daddy would get off a night shift. Next Wednesday night he comes, said, didn't work. Still on night shift. I said, well, <laughs> well we don't have a guarantee God's going to answer it the first time we pray about it. Uh, sometimes God wants to see how bad we want something. And He may put us into seasons of prayer. He may uh, put us, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we have to persist a little bit. We have to endure a little bit. But the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9, Be ye not weary and well-doing. For we shall reap if we faint not. So stick with it. So, there, there, so there, there's five things right there, if, if you wrote those down, uh, that are all scriptural that can help you meet your goal. Goals should be scriptural. Goals should challenge us. And then lastly, goals should always glorify God. They need to always glorify God. Now let me just say this. As kindly as I know how. 
If you say that you've got a goal for your life and you want to live for the Lord, but yet your goal takes you out of church, away from the Bible, and does not allow you for day, time for daily prayer, that is not a good goal. And that is not a scriptural goal, and that is not a goal that will glorify the Lord. And so the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or you drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory, to the glory of God. That includes your goals as well. So how may we glorify God? Well, we'll glorify God in our goals by letting man see our good works. Now that's what the Bible says in Matthew 5, 16. Uh, it, we bring glory and honor to the Lord when others see us fulfilling the goal for the glory of God. Now the Bible tells us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. They'll also, we'll also glorify God fulfilling the goals of our life uh, when we are bearing fruit for Him. The Bible says in John 15 and verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. The Bible says our good works glorify our Father. Our fruit bearing glorifies our Father. But then you remember me talking to you just a second ago about being persistent and enduring and sticking with it and not quitting. Don't get discouraged if it don't work the first week, if it don't work the second week, stick with it. God honors faithfulness. But the Bible tells us that we glorify God when we are completely consecrated to Him. In other words, He's not part of our life. He is our life. We're living for Him. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And all of us remember Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So goals should be scriptural. Goals should be challenging. And goals should glorify God. Now then, take your inventory that you took a while ago and bounce it against all these scriptures. Am I doing anything for God? Have I ever done anything for God? What am I doing now? And, 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 and is what, I, what I'm doing now, is it scriptural? Does it take sacrifice? Am I glorifying God or self? One final thought from the Word of God about setting goals for your life. And this one's from the Old Testament. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. Solomon said, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You see, to just meander around through life aimlessly is wasting time that you'll never get back. Whatever you're going to do for God, you can't do anything about the past. If you've never done anything for Him before, well, that's fine. There's nothing you can do about that now. But you can do something starting tonight. If you don't know what God wants you to do, come to this altar tonight. Y'all come on, let's have, a, let's have a song tonight. Let's, let's have an invitation tonight. Good place to start would be right up here on this altar. Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, I just don't feel like I'm doing anything for you. I'm just, I'm just existing. I go to church and read my Bible, but Lord, I just don't ever just don't seem to be doing anything. The altar would be a good place to start and ask Him. And then remember these scriptural things from the Bible about what a goal should be. Ask Him to help you. Ask Him to lead you. Ask Him to guide you. And spend the rest of your days 
not serving the flesh, but the Spirit, the things of God. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the Word of God tonight. We ask, Lord, that you'd bless uh, this time of invitation. Pray that you'd speak to hearts. Pray that you already have. Thy will be done in Jesus' name.